Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be connecting from, everyone. My name is Chris Doran. I am a technical sales specialist for Global Test Supply. Thank you for joining us uh, for our webinar today, brought to you by Global Test Supply University. Uh, today's topic is EVSC safety maintenance with Fluke. Uh, we'll be covering a lot of information uh, over the next 40 to 45 minutes. We will have uh, time at the end of uh, the presentation for some Q&A. We do encourage you to uh, ask any and all questions throughout the presentation. Two ways to do so, use the chat feature and or use the question, uh, question feature. Um, if do so during the presentation, you see something catch, uh, catch, your, catch your eye during a certain slide, you have something you wanna ask, shoot, shoot the question in right away and we'll get to it at the end of the presentation. Our Global Test Supply and Fluke have been working closely together for many years. We pride ourselves on being a leading distributor of Fluke in the US. This is a result of our dedication to offering you our product expertise, service, and our competitive pricing. Getting started today, the presentation is presented by Will White from Fluke. Will has worked in renewable energy industry since 2005, an installer, a designer, and a project manager. Experienced in wind power, solar thermal, energy storage, and all scales of PV. Will has primarily focused on residential and small commercial systems. He is passionate about implementing high quality code compliant installation techniques. In 2016, he joined SEI and focused on updating and developing course content and teaching in person and online. In 2022, Will joined Fluke as a solar application specialist where he supports the renewable energy testing equipment like IV curve tracers, electrical meters, and thermal imaging cameras. Will, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Chris. So today we'll talk, we'll be talking about electric vehicle supply equipment, and we're gonna start off with talking about some of the trends that we're seeing in electrical vehicle charging. But we'll talk about some of the different EV charger types, some of the different stations that we see. We'll talk about safety hazards when we're working on EV charging equipment and specifically get into some of the safety ratings for test and measurement equipment. We'll talk about EVSC testing and some of the operations and maintenance or O&M that goes into those systems as well. And then as Chris mentioned, we'll finish up with a question and answer segment. So here in the United States, uh, we're seeing massive growth in electric vehicle sales and EV charging infrastructure. Um, this table shows an estimate of the deployment of electrical vehicle charging ports here in the United States. Um, we can see on the left-hand side of the graph, that tiny little bar at the bottom is where we were at in 2020. And we're seeing about an estimated 16% growth per year going through 2050. So a massive expansion in the construction of electrical vehicle charging stations as EV charger, uh, electric vehicle sales increase as well. Uh, that of course will flow into EVSE operations and maintenance as well. There's a couple different types of electric vehicle supply equipment. Uh, first is a level one or level two residential system. Uh, these chargers cost between about $300 to $700. Um, they're really for at-home charging by the homeowner uh, for their electrical vehicles. Um, the power supply to these chargers typically comes from a household outlet. A uh, circuit needs to be run dedicated for the charger. Um, some of these chargers can be hardwired. They are usually either 120 volts for the level one chargers, 240 volts for the level two chargers. And we see up to about 12 kilowatts of power maximum on this type of charger, although most of them top out at about 9.6 kilowatts. It's gonna take essentially overnight, usually 10 to 12 hours to fully charge an electric vehicle on a level two charger in a residential situation. Um, as I mentioned, these need a dedicated circuit. So the cost of the installation and the unit runs about $3,000. Um, there's very little maintenance on residential chargers and the, you know, only can it repairs and troubleshooting if it gets damaged for some reason. Next, we have level two public chargers. Um, these are more expensive than their residential counterparts. They typically range from one to $7,000 for the charger itself. Um, they're designed to be used either in a public location, uh, parking garages, stores, or in private businesses for their employees. 
they can be supplied directly from the grid with a, a direct grid connection, obviously through, through utility, utility meter, or they can go through the building's uh, electrical supply equipment off a, a main load center from the building that they're associated with. Uh, these are 240 volt systems and they offer charging rates of up to 19.2 kilowatts. So at that higher rate, you can charge an electric vehicle in about two to three hours. Um, installation cost for these runs about $12,000 per unit. And there, there's very little maintenance, annual maintenance on these. Mostly we're doing troubleshooting for uh, damage or issues with the charger. The other type of charger is a DC fast charger. Um, these are more expensive. The charger itself runs for about twenty dollars to $50,000. Um, these are being installed in locations with a lot of traffic, um, along highways, at busy commercial uh, buildings, uh, places where it's easy for people to charge quickly. They are typically uh, connected directly to the utility grid, not through another building. So they have their own service, their own electrical meter. They're three phase systems. So they're operating on the AC side at either 208 or 480 volts. And they offer charging power up to 360 kilowatts. You know, at those higher charging rates, it can take less than an hour to fully charge an electric vehicle. Installation cost is uh, significantly more than a level two charger at around $30,000 per unit. Um, some of these chargers do have routine annual maintenance, and they also have the, the troubleshooting that goes along with some of the other uh, level two chargers as well. Uh, they're estimating that they can cost about $10,000 a year per maintenance uh, per charger. Uh, DC fast chargers are the uh, where we're seeing the most growth um, because they're the, the faster charging um, more in uh, public places along highways and things like that. Let's look at a couple of examples of some public charging stations. This is a level two charging station. This is at the Fred Myers a grocery chain near Fluke's headquarters in Everett, Washington. Uh, we see a couple of the level two chargers in the upper right hand picture. Uh, they have a transformer. It's not a dedicated transformer for the chargers. Um, it works uh, to serve all the, the lights and the general receptacles uh, in the parking lot along with the level two chargers. Um, so that's taking the medium voltage 13.8 kV down to 480 for um, the, the level uh, two chargers, which uh, in this case, I'm not sure if these are a, a 480 or if they're actually operating it at 240. Um, they have a, a level two, these uh, can do up to seven kilowatts, so um, a bit lower power than some of the other level two chargers that are on the market. They've got a type one connector. Um, they're a um, lower charging rate than a DC fast charger, um, but they are easier to deploy. They don't need quite as much infrastructure or capital uh, to, to construct in these types of uh, commercial situations. We've got a DC fast charger. This is also in Everett, Washington, where Fluke's headquarters is. This is at the, the Walmart. Um, it is a dedicated charging station. So this setup has its own step-down transformer, uh, same type of transformer we saw in the last one, going from 13.8 kV medium voltage down to 480, three phase. Uh, we've got some other associated equipment with it as well, switch gear to uh, overcurrent protection devices and, and whatnot. Uh, these chargers are DC fast chargers, so they can charge up to 322 kilowatts. They have a type uh, T1, T2 connector there as well. And again, these are the uh, type of charger that's getting deployed most frequently in commercial situations. Now, these are quite expensive to deploy. Uh, you know, we talked about about $50,000 per charging unit. What do we have? Uh, we've got 10 units here, so you're talking $500,000 uh, to build a, a unit of this kind of size and, and type. Let's talk about some electrical hazards that we run into when working on these types of systems. So in 2020, in the United States, there were 126 electrical fatalities and uh, about 2,200 um, non-fatal injuries that resulted in lost time from work. Um, we can see the cause of the electric fatalities, the majority came from contact with overhead power lines, uh, but almost 45% came from working on energized parts. So obviously, if we can avoid working on energized parts, that's going to be a lot safer than working on an energized system. So if we're opening up these electrical vehicle supply equipment, 
there's going to be exposed conductors. Uh, if we haven't de-energized it, there's going to be a lot of live parts in there. Um, if there's a ground fault in the system, a current carrying conductor is, is unintentionally connected to ground. Uh, there could be energized metal parts, specifically the case of the electric vehicle charger, if it's a metal case. Um, we could see arc faults in there from um, high resistance connections. They could cause uh, damage to the EV charger. They all could also cause a shock and a fire hazard. And if you're working in the, the higher power DC chargers, um, arc faults could also create an arc flash hazard as well, uh, depending on the potential for, from that equipment. So we have some guidelines here in the United States uh, that are requirements when we're working on any type of electrical equipment. Um, as the hazard increases, the type of personal protective equipment will increase as well. Uh, we can find our rules and regulations uh, from OSHA in 1910, which is the general industry, re industry regulations, and in 1926, which is specific to the construction industry. And both of these regulations have very uh, similar requirements when it comes to electrical hazards. We also have NFPA 70E, which takes the OSHA standards and tells us how to implement them. So it's going to give us a lot of really good information on how to run our job sites so that they're uh, reducing the uh, safety hazards uh, on that specific site. Now, NFPA 70E has some specific requirements when it comes to test and measurement equipment. Um, that equipment shall be rated for the circuits and the equipment which we're going to be connected to. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in another slide here. Uh, they have to be designed for the environment in which they're going to be used. So if we're using those uh, outside, which is where most of our electric vehicle supply equipment is going to be located, they need to be rated for that type of environment, whether it's uh, wet and raining outside or cold temperatures, it has to be properly rated for that, that those type of conditions. We need to inspect our test and measurement equipment before we use them. We need to make sure that there's no damages or defects. Um, if there are, we need to get those repaired before we use them. Um, Fluke has a really great uh, training module on our website about how to inspect uh, multimeters and what to look for when we're inspecting them. So if you haven't seen that before, that's uh, free and available on our website. The installation of the protective tools also needs to be in good condition. So if it's damaged, it needs to be replaced, so that would need to be tested. Of course, our equipment uh, tools are tested at the factory, so we know they're good to go out of the box. Um, they should be uh, tested and inspected on a, a somewhat regular basis. Now, the reason that we're doing this is for uh, transient voltages. That's one of the main hazards we see when we're doing test and measurement. Uh, a transient is a momentary unwanted spike in voltage. We can see on the chart on the right, uh, really high voltage uh, for a very short duration of time. Um, transients are caused by a sudden release of stored energy. And that could be from uh, turning a motor off or switching off a different inductive load. It could be an equipment malfunction could be from utilities doing load switching on the utility side of the system, or it could be from a lightning strike. Um, transients are unavoidable. Um, they're very short duration, but they can be really dangerous. And this last bullet is really uh, nicely saying that transients can destroy equipment. Um, they can cause arcs, uh, shorts. Uh, they can actually blow up test and measurement equipment, which uh, obviously would be a real hazard to the technician using that equipment. Um, so we need to make sure we have the right equipment for the job. Now, how do we do, how do we identify the right equipment for what we're working on? Um, the first thing we need to do is identify the category of the location where we are doing our testing. The closer we get to the utility, the greater the hazard is from transient voltage spikes. Um, so when we're working close to the utility, that's considered a category four environment. Um, this would be our transformers at the utility, um, utility meters, and our, our main service disconnect. So anything that's really close to the utility, that's where the highest risk of transient voltage is, is going to be located. Next is our category three environment. That's our three-phase distribution equipment, like our, our service panels. Um, could include single-phase commercial lighting. Um, some fixed loads in uh, commercial environments especially could be considered a category three environment. Um, I work a lot on the solar side of our products. A solar array is considered a category three work environment. 
And finally, we have a category two environment, and this is our branch circuits, our single phase loads, um, any kind of receptacles, uh, could be three phase, it depends on how close it is to the service equipment and the utility. Um, there is, a, in, incidentally, a category one environment as well, and that's electrical electrical equipment that is not connected to any type of service. So a uh, standalone uh, solar powered light would be a, a, an example of a category one environment. Um, obviously with a, a EV charging infrastructure, uh, we're gonna be usually in a category two environment, especially if we're talking about the level two chargers, which is what we're gonna be focused on uh, in this presentation. So once we have identified the category of our work environment, we need to figure out the voltage level of the equipment that we're working on. Uh, level two chargers are typically gonna be operating at 240 volts. So the test and measurement equipment that we are going to uh, specify for doing the testing that we're gonna do on the uh, EV supply equipment, it needs to be rated for the category, in this most cases category two, uh, occasionally it could be category three or even category four if we're working on uh, DC fast chargers. Um, and it has to have the voltage rating for this type of system that we're testing. So again, level two chargers in most cases are gonna be a category two, uh, 240 volt uh, level. We need to make sure that the test leads that we're using match the rating of our meter. Um, in EV charging, uh, troubleshooting and maintenance, that's usually not gonna be a problem since we're working at relatively low voltage. Um, this really applies when we're working on higher voltage systems, say 1500 volt DC solar arrays are a great example. Um, when you're working at 1500 volts, you need to make sure you have the leads that rat match that voltage rating, and you can't just grab leads off the shelf which might not have that, that specific voltage rating. Um, the voltage rating tells us how much transient the uh, test equipment can withstand. So category 3000 volts can withstand up to eight, eight kilovolts of transients where a category three 600 volt can only withstand uh, 6,000 uh, volts of transient. So another thing to really keep in mind is that uh, some test and measurement equipment may have a specific voltage rating, but the category rating that that equipment is tested at may be lower. So that's um, something you wanna keep a look at, especially if you're looking at equipment that's imported maybe from uh, China or from Europe, um, that you wanna know that the category voltage rating is the same as what the actual rating of the device is. Um, it won't so much be a problem at these, these lower voltages, but when you get into higher voltage systems like the 1500 volt systems in uh, solar arrays, uh, oftentimes you'll see a meter that's listed as testing up to 1500 volts, but the category three rating may only be 600 volts or 1000 volts. So that's something that we wanna keep an eye out for and avoid. So the important thing to remember here is that we need to identify the category of the environment that we're working in and what voltage is the equipment that we're gonna be testing and then find test and measurement equipment that meets both that category and voltage rating. It's really easy to find the category and voltage rating on your test and measurement equipment. Uh, here we have a picture of Flukes FEV100. This is our electric vehicle supply equipment um, testing device. Uh, it is category two, 250 volt rated. Um, it's really designed to be used on those level two chargers that don't operate above uh, 250 volts. So uh, it's, a, it's rated properly for, for those type of, uh, type of tests. Um, give you some other examples uh, of our clamp meter line. Uh, this is the 325 clamp meter. It's rated for category three, 600 volts. Um, category three, again, the rating of uh, solar arrays. So this could be used on a residential system for residential solar. Um, this is our 378 clamp meter. This is a category 3000 volt rated. So we could use this on uh, commercial and industrial solar uh, roof mounted systems that would go up to a thousand volts. Uh, and finally, we have the 393 clamp meter. This is category three, 1500 volt rated. So utility scale solar arrays, um, this would be a, a good device for, for that. Now, one thing I wanna point out here, you can see these, uh, these pictures match the physical reality where as the voltage rating goes up within the same category, the size of the tool gets larger. And the reason for that is because as the voltage goes up, the requirements for what's called creep and clearage go up as well. 
Um, so we need more space internally in that meter to be able to withstand those transient voltage spikes uh, and meet that category and voltage rating and still be safe for the, uh, the test technician. So as that category and voltage rating goes up, meter tends to get bigger to be able to withstand those transient voltage spikes. So whenever we're doing test and measurement, we want to make sure that we're thinking of safety first. Um, Working on electric vehicle supply equipment, uh, EV chargers, in most cases, if we're getting into the device itself, we should de-energize the system and not need to work on it while it's, it's still energized. Um, all these EV chargers are gonna have overcurrent protection device, uh, breakers or disconnects that we can shut off um, so we can follow lockout tagout procedures. Um, there's lots of training courses online on lockout tagout, so check those out if you're not familiar with lockout tagout procedures. Um, we have to maintain our tools, make sure that they're operating properly, make sure that the, the leads aren't damaged and that everything is working right. Um, especially with test and measurement equipment, it's important to make sure they have the right fuses installed. Um, Fluke tools use very specific fuses, so if you blow a fuse, uh, don't go down to the hardware store and just pick up a random fuse that fits in the fuse holder. Um, get the one that's properly rated for, for the type of equipment that you're working on. We also want to make sure we have the proper personal protective equipment. Um, could be anything on this list here from safety glasses all the way through to full arc flash hazard suits, depending on the hazard level of the equipment that you're working on. Try not to work alone. I know it can be hard when you're uh, doing troubleshooting, especially for small companies and uh, working on uh, you know small installations for EV chargers. Um, at least have someone else there on site, whether it's the homeowner, um, someone you know working in the commercial building that knows you're there working on the system, um, so that in case there is an emergency, there's someone there who would be able to assist you. We want to practice safe measurement techniques. Uh, the process of doing that, especially if we're doing voltage testing, is to connect our lead to the grounded conductor first, the neutral wire, and then to our hot current carrying conductor second take the measurement, and then when we're disconnecting our test leads, we're gonna do it the opposite way. We're gonna disconnect the, the hot ungrounded conductor first, and then the grounded conductor second. Um, that's the proper way to, to uh, do our test and measurement sequence. Now, if we're working on de-energized systems, we need to verify that the circuit is actually de-energized before we go working on it. And we're gonna use a live dead live test procedure. Um, this procedure, we're going to take our meter, we're going to test a known voltage source to make sure our meter is working properly. And that could be a different branch circuit, an outlet. It could be a, a proving unit like the PRV240 from Fluke, which is a known voltage source. So we test to make sure our meter is working. Then we're going to test our circuit to make sure it's de-energized. So since it's off, we're looking for zero voltage. And then we're going to retest our meter on that known voltage source to ensure that the meter didn't stop working after the first known voltage test. Um, by doing this process, we know that our meter is working properly, and we know that the circuit that we're working on is de-energized. Um, very important to, to verify that the system is actually turned off. Um, I had a situation where some electricians were working on a solar array that they, uh, they thought the AC line was turned off. Um, they went, shut off the breaker, locked it out, uh, went, started to work on it, got electric shock, and turned out that the electricians who installed that circuit had, uh, had labeled it wrong. So they thought they were shutting off the solar circuit, but really it was a different circuit. And the one that they were working on was still energized. So turn it off, lock it out, tag out, but make sure you verify before you start working on the, the equipment. There are a um, couple of standards that we can use when we're working on uh, EV charging stations, uh, specifically the IEC 61851 and SAEJ 1772. Um, these will give us, give us some ideas of the maintenance procedures uh, that we need to use when we're working on EV service equipment or EV supply equipment. Some of the tests that are involved are ensuring that there's no ground faults, um, checking the insulation on the wires to ensure it hasn't been compromised. Uh, we're going to check voltage at the uh, contacts at the charger itself. That would be on the plugs at the end of the charger. And we want to make sure that um, the, the charger can communicate with the electric vehicle uh, to deliver the level of power that the vehicle requires. So that is going to be our uh, control pilot signal coming from the EV going to the charger to tell it you know, what rate of power to deliver to the vehicle. 
So how do we conduct these tests? You know, once the installation has been done, uh, how does the test uh, technician go and actually check this EV charger to make sure it's working properly? Um, right now, the most common way is to have an electric vehicle on site. So technician shows up in an electric vehicle, uses that to test the, the EV charger. Um, the problem with that is that it can be hard to determine whether if a problem is identified, if the problem is with the EV charger or with the vehicle. Um, it, you don't really know which one is, is having the issue. So um, that's a, one of the downfalls of using a vehicle. Um, without an electric vehicle at the electric vehicle charging station, um, there's not going to be any voltage present at the connector uh, uh, connected to the EV charger. Um, unless it gets that control pilot signal to turn the charger on. So without an electric vehicle uh, or the proper test equipment, it's going to be impossible to check voltage at that, uh, that connector at the end of the EV charger. Um, SAE did a study and found that there's a, currently a really high failure rate for electric vehicle supply equipment. It's running about 30 to 50%. Um, so that means if you show up to an EV charging station, there's a good chance that somewhere between 30 to 50% of those chargers aren't going to be working. Um, of course, as we scale up the EV charging industry, it's really important for customer satisfaction that these chargers be reliable and working when they need to use them. Um, so having that ability to test those chargers uh, in order to troubleshoot them is really important. So what kind of problems can we run into when we're doing um, EV troubleshooting? Um, you can't test an EV if you uh, don't have an electric vehicle or a tool that can uh, that can simulate an EV charger. So if you don't have that that proper equipment, um, you might have to go back to the site again. Um, if the EV is not being charged, um, you know that that's a common problem where you you plug the connector into the EV and the charge doesn't start up. Um, there's not enough electric vehicles for most technicians to go around having an EV on site. Um, the electric vehicles have different connectors and different adapters on the electric vehicle charging stations, and they're they're all a bit different, although the type one connector is one of the most prevalent here in the United States. Um, currently, there's not a lot of technical solutions in the market um, to test electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, one that we're going to talk about right now is the Fluke FEV100. Um, this is a, a test adapter. Uh, it essentially emulates an electric vehicle, so the charging station thinks there's an EV there, and we can go through and do some tests on the station uh, with the FEV100 um, emulator. Um, one of the things that the, the device will do itself is a PE pretest, so it's going to check to see if there's any voltage on the ground to make sure that there's not already a ground fault. Um, we can, it will um, simulate the control pilot uh, signal, so it will tell the charger to turn on to different charging states depending on uh, what you select on the FEV100. Um, we can do uh, uh, no, the FEV100 will know if there's a ground fault or control pilot error. Um, so it, it can uh, sense if there's an error there. Uh, it can also essentially simulate those errors um, so that we can test to make sure that the uh, EV charger is reacting to those errors properly. Um, the FEV100 will test the ground fault protection device in the EV charger, um, so we can uh, simulate a ground fault so that uh, we ensure that that uh, ground fault protection device operated and stopped the closing cycle. Um, the FEV100 is designed to be test connected to other test and measurement tools. Um, we can see that there's some ports on the front of the device. There's also a couple ports on the top of the device. Um, we can connect different multimeters and insulation resistance testers to the ports on the front, and we can connect multimeters and scope meters to the connections on the top um, to test for different things like uh, the voltage coming from the charging station, um, the waveform coming from the charging station, the um, frequency of the control pilot signal, we can do loop impedance, resistance, insulation resistance testing, uh, a whole bunch of different tests using that FEV100 with additional test and measurement tools. Um, so it's a great tool to use when you're doing troubleshooting and maintenance on an EV charging station, a level two uh, charging station speci specifically. Um, and it allows you to not need an electric vehicle. 
Um, it doesn't, you, you don't need to have a vehicle that needs to be charged up. You know, if you show up at the site and your vehicle's already charged, you're not gonna be able to do any tests on it. So uh, the FEV 100 prevents that. Uh, also has a, a bunch of different tests all kind of packed into one uh, platform. So let's talk about some of the safety tests that we can do with the FEV 100. Um, the first one is that uh, the, the protective earth pretest. So this is ensuring that there's no voltage present on the ground. Um, if there was voltage present, it would indicate a ground fault. So we'd need to take some uh, preventative measures there before we did any other type of testing. It'll test the ground fault interruption circuit. Uh, talked about this a little bit. Um, the FEV 100 will simulate a ground fault to ensure that the ground fault protection device of the EV charger activates, um, stops the recharging cycle um, to make sure that it, you know, it's working safely. Um, we can, yeah, as I just said, we can uh, do a PE error also, which is simulating a ground fault as well um, to make sure that that charging process is stopped and to make sure that it doesn't restart charging until that ground fault is, uh, is fixed. Um, the control pilot has an error uh, state um, and that error state can be caused for a couple different reasons. It could be that the connector from the electric vehicle charger was disconnected from the vehicle. So we want to make sure that the, the uh, EV charger stops charging when that connector uh, becomes disconnected. Um, the EV charger might have lost power from the utility or come disconnected from the utility for some reason. Um, or there could be a short on the control pilot uh, ground um, so that that control pilot signal is not working properly. Um, the important thing here is that when we simulate this error, the EV charger stops charging so that there's no hazard there at the, at the end of the, the plug from the, the uh, EV charger. We can also do some additional measurements with the FEV 100. Um, plugging it into those ports on the front with a multimeter, we can check the voltage coming from the charging station. Um, so we can see if the voltage is within the, the parameters of the, uh, what the, the vehicle needs for that charging cycle. Um, we can also identify the maximum charging current. If you have a multimeter that can measure the duty cycle, um, you can go into the FEV 100 manual and there is a, a table in there that allows you to identify what uh, percentage the duty cycle is um, versus the charging current. So uh, here's the table out of the manual. Um, we can see uh, that we can measure the duty cycle and it will tell us the corresponding amps based on that duty cycle. So a good multimeter would be uh, the 87.5 or the 87.5 max have a duty cycle measurement capability. Um, so you could go in and see what the corresponding current would be uh, based on that duty cycle percentage. Let's see, we can also analyze the waveform and that's what we see being done here. Um, so this is a uh, 125B scope meter that's connected into the top of the, the FEV 100. And the, the control pilot signal works on frequency. So as you change the charging state from A through D, that frequency of that control pilot signal changes. And there's a specification for what that frequency change needs to be. And with an uh, an oscilloscope like the 125B scope meter, uh, you can see the frequency of that control pilot signal change. Um, so as we change the different states on the FEV 100, we should see the corresponding change in frequency of that control pilot signal. So a bunch of different tests we can do uh, with the FEV 100. Um, we can simulate an electric vehicle and do our test and measurement and troubleshooting on site without actually having to have an electric vehicle there with us. Um, also makes it very fast to go through different tests on that, uh, that EV supply equipment. So um, that's the end of the presentation. So I think at this point, uh, we'll, we'll go to Chris and open it up to, uh, to some questions. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, okay, so we have a good 20 or so minutes left uh, for a Q&A. So please, this is the time to take advantage of uh, having an expert like Will with us today. So get any and all of your questions in. Again, quick reminder, you can use the chat feature, you can use the question feature uh, to get them all in there. A quick note, uh, we talked about a few instruments, we talked about you know some stuff during the presentation. 
If you have any questions related to uh, specific products uh, and that uh, refers to pricing, availability, um, certain specifications that you know might be a little bit more application specific, um, copies of data sheets, anything and everything alike, um, instead of asking that here, I'm going to encourage you to go visit our website, globaltestsupply.com. You'll find our entire product list. We have a site dedicated to Fluke and all the products within that site itself. Uh, you can go visit there. You'll find the data sheets, the manuals, uh, technical specifications. On top of that, you'll also find a way to contact one of our technical sales teams that can help you to answer specific questions like that whether it be chat, live chat, uh, over the phone, email, myself, one of my colleagues will be happy to answer any and all of your questions. Um, so again, please use the chat feature. Uh, we do have a couple questions that have come in. Michael uh, has a couple questions. Um, is there a set of test points that are required for testing uh, EBSC, like a predefined set of tests that are required by either the manufacturer or regulatory uh, requirements as of right now? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, and that the question really, the answer really depends. Um, first off, I'm gonna tell you uh, what we tell students at Solar Energy International quite frequently, which is RTFM, the Read Your Free Manual. Um, so go through the manual that comes with your, uh, the specific equipment that you're working on, and they'll give you an idea of what uh, tests that you need to be doing on the system, uh, especially if you're needing to do annual maintenance on it, it'll, they'll, they'll give you specifications on that. Um, there's no other required standard here in the United States. Um, that IEC standard, uh, which we you can go back and reference, and I can send Chris the PDF of this presentation as well so that, that he can send that out. Um, that IEC standard will have a list of tests that, that they recommend. It's not a requirement per se, uh, but at least it gives you some some standard to go, go by. Perfect. Again, I think this was covered, but again, it's worth going back over. Um, does Fluke manufacture a test set or an instrument that can actually draw uh, a load from the charger itself? Mm. That's a good question. Uh, we don't, and I don't know of anyone that actually has a port, you know, kind of like a portable load, or I've heard it referred to as a, an EV in a box. Um, yeah, no one has that available at this point. Um, it's something that we're investigating at Fluke. Um, the most obvious answer would be have an electric vehicle on site. I mean, that's that's the, the best load. Um, the That duty cycle measurement will give you an idea of what the current that the EV charger would be putting out as you're testing it. So it, it's not directly testing that current, but it, it'll give you an idea of the kind of the, the charging uh, current level of that of that device. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of EV in a box is something that, that we've been uh, looking at. A uh, quick follow-up, because it is uh, here down the list. Um, why is it important to uh, use an instrument that has a duty cycle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the, and I'm not a, an expert on measuring duty cycles, but um, that's what's used to essentially uh, to uh, figure out the percentage of duty cycle is re directly related to the current generating capacity of that e EV charger. So to correlate that that duty cycle to the charging rate, um, that that's why you need it. Um, a meter that doesn't have the ability to measure duty cycle would not be able to do that correlation. So um, so yeah, it's uh, important to have a meter that can do that. Uh, the Fluke 87.5 is, is a good option. It comes in one of the kits that comes with the FEV 100. Um, so, so that's a good, a good way to do it. Yeah, without having to you know, directly measure that, that current. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, John asks, uh, what company or what companies usually does the EV, uh, I guess, installs the EV charging, um, EV charging station, as well as would it be on on the manufacturer to for the installation and the uh, the follow up for the maintenance, or would that be outsourced? 
Yeah, it, it depends. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it all depends. There are many different companies offering electric vehicle charging station installations. Um, they're everywhere from local electrical contractors. Uh, a lot of solar installers are getting into EV charging. Um, there's a, companies like QMerit that has a network of EV chargers across uh, the country and they're expanding internationally as well. Um, so it, it depends. Now the, the kind of the second part of the question of who's going to maintain that system, uh, that's a great question and it varies. Uh, it, a lot of that depends on who owns the system. So you, if you've got systems owned by um, like ChargePoint, which is a big network of EV chargers, they're going to maintain their own systems. Um, if a system's owned by a third party and leased to the site host, or you know, th there's all kinds of different ways to work that. Um, right now, unfortunately, a lot of them, to be honest, aren't being maintained. Um, and that's where we lead to that 30 to 50% failure rate, uh, because they, I think at this point, the, the troubleshooting O&M technician capacity has not kept up with the the construction of these EV charging stations. So uh, great opportunity. So if any of you are uh, electrical contractors that work in other sectors, um, you know this is a good market to get into. There's uh, literally billions of dollars uh, in the federal government that's earmarked for EV charging infrastructure here in the United States. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, good kind of segue and follow up into that is, Based on the fact that this is an exploding industry, and, and you know, not 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 literally, hopefully, <laughs> you are absolutely correct. <laughs> um, what about regulations? Um, do you like? Do you know of any regulations that have come in that, you know, are we looking at um, specific regulations based on state, based on territory? Uh, you know, I, I've seen and, and I've gotten questions about um, how this is going to affect. Uh, home insurance, commercial insurance. Um, do you know of any specific regulations when it comes to the installation and or even the maintenance aspect of the charging stations themselves? You know, that's a good question. I, I pull out my National Electrical Code book here. Uh, this is the 2023 edition, which just came out um, not too long ago. Um, and I'm just looking to see if EV charging has gotten its own article in the NEC which I don't think it does at this point. Uh, electric vehicle power transfer systems, Article 625. So, I mean, the reality is, is that EV charging infrastructure is it's electrical equipment, it's specialty electrical equipment. Um, so yes, we get Article 625 now in the NEC. Uh, I have not dug into it and I'm guessing it's not very long, um, but that's where we're gonna go to. And we'll see what happened with, um, we, we'll see, EV charging regulations will probably follow very closely what we saw in solar, where you know Article 690 started out as a couple of pages and now it's tons of stuff. Um, so as the industry expands and grows, we'll see regulation uh, become more uh, prevalent. Now, otherwise, I mean, it's pretty much just a load, it, it, like we would see with any other any other type of load. Um, there's some variability to it, of course, but uh, you know your overcurrent protection device sizes, voltage calculations are, are all going to be the same as you would for any other you know, type of load. So um, a lot of that is very similar to what you'd see with regular electrical equipment. Um, and of course, it's going to vary by jurisdiction as well. Everybody has a different, you know, they're on different versions of the code cycle. They make different uh, nuance changes, especially when you get into states like California and Massachusetts. Um, so they, they've always got a little bit of a different take on it, but um, know what the code is in your area. Um, if you're doing installation, something that I've had really good luck with in the solar uh, area is, especially when you're getting into an area where this is something the inspector hasn't seen before, um, bring them in early. You know, have a meeting with the inspector uh, either on site or at their office before you start the installation. Say, this is what I'm going to be doing. You know, these are the appropriate codes. Like, do you have any comments, questions? Do you, do you need any more information? Um, that's going to head off a lot of problems on the front end. Perfect. Something again that I, the, you know, I know that myself and our team has, has, has gotten a few times. Do we have an appropriate or do we have a specific instrument to use um, to data log um, 
the you know our voltage our current coming from the charging station station itself yeah that's a good question um so data log the fev 100 will not data log um, it, it is essentially an adapter it's got some of the the safety tests built into it that we discussed already um, but all the other tests are going to be done with external test and measurement equipment so different multimeters insulation resistance testers scope meters um, so it really depends on the type of meter that you're using so if you're using a meter um, like a, a scope meter that can do data logging uh, then yes absolutely it will data log like it would with any other application um, same thing when you get into a, like the fluke connected devices uh, if you get a, a 378 clamp meter that has fluke connect um, that that can data log there uh, yeah it would data log like it would in any other application perfect um and what about an instrument um to test the fast uh, the fast charge of the dc charger is there anything currently is there anything incoming yeah we have, fluke doesn't have anything in our portfolio to, to test dc fast chargers other than the regular standard meters and test equipment that you'd use on any voltage or current source um, we are working on uh, some dc fast charger test specific test equipment and so that'll be out sometime in the, in the relatively near future perfect uh quick reminder everyone uh, any product specific questions or anything like that uh go to web go to website you've got a page dedicated to all things fluke uh, pricing, availability, manuals, data sheets, everything. All right. Um, so, how can I use the FEV 100 to analyze the control pilot signal? Yep. So let me go back. Uh, go back a slide here. So here, uh, this is what this technician is doing right in this picture. So uh, the top of the FEV 100 are two ports that allow you to measure that control pilot signal. And as I mentioned, the, the signal uh, is based on frequency. So this uh, 125, I believe this is a 125B scope meter, um, it can measure the frequency so we can see the visual signal. And there's a standard for the, how the frequency changes based on the control pilot uh, state. So there's states A through D. Um, so you can, as you change that control pilot state, which tells the EV charger to uh, change the charging the state. Uh, as that control pilot signal changes, the frequency of the signal changes. So you can see that frequency change with the with the scope meter itself. Um, so that yeah, that's the the, the sim simple answer. It's a it's a pretty straightforward process as long as you've got the right tool to to measure that frequency. Perfect. And one last question: the FEV 100 um, does it come with a sort of universal plug? Uh, that will test any charging station, or is it more specific? Yeah, it, it comes with the Type 1 plug, which is the most common plug that we see uh, here domestically. Uh, we also have a Tesla-specific plug as well. Um, there are a whole ton of different plugs, especially when you get into you know, like European-style plugs and, and uh, Asian-style plugs. Uh, but here, the, the Type 1 plug that we supply with the FEV100 is the most common. Um, again, you can get a kit that's got uh, the, t the Tesla plug as well, which you can also buy separately. But. Perfect. And again, uh, for questions relating specifically to the FEV100 pricing, um, there, there are a bunch of kits available for that specific unit. Um, so if you have any questions about that or you want to go check it out, globaltestsupply.com. We have a great search bar. You can just type in the FEV100. It'll come up with all the results um, for the unit itself, the kits available, what they're included, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it looks like those are the last of the questions. So I will thank you, uh, Will, once again for the great presentation. And I'm going to thank all of you for joining us today. We hope that you found the webinar uh, informative and helpful. Again, as I mentioned a lot during these webinars, we're available to help you in any way that we can. Go to globaltestsupply.com, find out how you can connect with us, whether it be over the phone, live chat, email, however you'd like, all the information can be found at globaltestsupply.com. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we will have a short survey that we, uh, we'd like you to complete if possible. Uh, your feedback will assist us on improving our these webinars and allow us to bring you topics that are of interest to you. 
Uh, we will have future webinars coming up over the course of the next few weeks and few months, along with recordings of previous webinars that we've done in the last few months and years. Uh, those can be found on our trainings tab on globaltestsupply.com, so make sure to check us out there. And also, don't forget that as a thank you for attending our webinar today, your name will be entered into a draw to win $100 on your next online order. The winner will receive an email with all the details on how to claim that, um, that, claim that prize. So once again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Will, thank you very much once again for the presentation, and I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.